the resources that are needed. Um, but actually, I think in this crisis, um, you know, it's really shown how important a mayor can be uh, in providing that civic leadership to cover the conurbation over such a large area. Uh, so thank you, Andy, for the work that you're doing uh, together Thanks. with the team to support you in the background uh, as well. I probably uh, just placed two ideas. It strikes me that the idea of a, uh, a lease back function for new electric buses is an excellent idea. Uh, I wonder if that's one of the areas where the pension fund uh, might look to uh, maybe intervene in terms of a long-term relatively secure investment without it going on the, uh, the balance sheets of the local authorities or the transport authority. Uh, and then in terms of the clean air zone, obviously we're all concerned about um, the polluted air that we have to breathe, uh, the impact that has on uh, life expectancy for far too many people, they pass away as a direct result uh, of, of the air quality. There is that tension though around how you manage the transition uh, particularly for the taxi drivers, for the small businesses, for the self-employed who maybe need to convert uh, to a van in what economically has been a very difficult period. Uh, and actually, I wonder whether or not I focus on the boom industries, because even though COVID has definitely had an impact on many parts of uh, different you know, sectors, uh, well, actually, online delivery, home delivery has boomed. Yeah. Um, I think Hermes are taking on 10,000 uh, uh, people in the warehousing and directly employed couriers, but then on top of that, 6,000 uh, take on new couriers. But a lot of those are driving around in diesel vans, some of them actually not even meeting modern standards, uh, driving around in private cars with the parcels just crammed in the back uh, so they get to as many uh, as possible. It strikes me that given that's a boom industry, that we ought to be requiring that every vehicle that drives around delivering parcels in Greater Manchester by a given date will have to be electric and that will form part of that wider strategy. And, and they will effectively, James, just to jump in on that because uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think any big players that own those vehicles, um, really, the onus is on them to make, you know, they've, as you say, they've made a lot of money, so they should be now getting ready to, to replace those, those vehicles or, or, or realloc relocate those vehicles to elsewhere where they don't have a clean air zone. So it's, it's the people, it's the smaller players that we've got to be worried about, I think, as a, as a group. But actually, the taxi drivers, obviously, who are already... Um, protesting outside of my office and I can understand why because it's been a really really tough year uh, for a lot of them and I think the truth of the matter is we don't yet have sufficient funding from central government to support the switch from uh, polluting vehicles to, to the to the cleaner compliant vehicles and I do think um, the taxi trade has to be our our top priority there given everything that they've been through um, all of our boroughs, including yours, you know, has a, a high number of people who work in the in the taxi trade. And um, what I want TFGM to do is make a sort of a, a, a package for people that basically doesn't leave them out of pocket if we can make it work. Where there might be a loan, a grant plus loan, to to change the vehicle, but then the running costs are almost the repayment costs of the loan. You know, the savings people can make. Now I don't know how you make all of this add up, and it's challenging, but that's where we need to um, to try and get to, uh, uh, Jim. Um, it's obviously a little bit of business support in a difficult, difficult time. The risk for the government is, you know, it's, it's instructed the 10 districts to create this uh, clean air zone. And if they uh, kind of do that, but then don't provide sufficient support, it does become a, a government clean air tax um, on businesses at a time where they can really not really, uh, you know, afford to, um, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to cover it. So, you know, there is a sort of, there is a political risk for the government here and for us probably, you know, in terms of everyone, everyone will get the blame, no, no, no doubt. But I think that's why we should probably work as one, as one all party group to say, create funding packages here that, that help everybody uh, switch their, their vehicles. And, and actually, if you think about it, the, you know, the running costs can, once you've got people in that new space, you know, there's, there's financial benefits here for people if we can make this, um, uh, make this uh, work. The vans are on a slight delay, you know, so the vans come in slightly later because the, the van technology, clean van technology is, is a little less developed than in the other, in buses and taxis. But um, the consultation opens very soon, so it opens on the 8th of October. And, you know, for constituency MPs like you, you, yourself, um, the letters will start arriving <laughs> on the 9th of October. So I think, uh, and I know all the members of the group uh, will be in the same boat there. So, uh, you know, you could write letters back saying, blame the mayor, he's a nightmare, yeah, it's all his fault, uh, but, uh, or blame the government, it's all their fault. I mean, I think you know, maybe the Tory MPs will say it's all my fault, the Labour MPs will say it's all the government's fault. 
I think the best thing is if we all say, well, let's try and fix it together and um, come up with a, you know, a financial package that's, that takes the worry away for our taxi drivers. And I think we've got to focus our minds on that issue very, very much now. Great, thank you, Andy. Conscious that you have a few minutes before your next meeting, uh, can I just check if uh, now or Jeff, as members of the uh, our party group, have any questions before Andy leaves, and then we'll move on to the panel debate. Um, thanks, Jim, uh, and, um, and thanks, Andy. Unfortunately, I've got to leave as well for a few minutes, um, but just want to thank you for 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 what you said. Um, and and Jim's obviously been doing quite good work on on on, on public transport, not only in Greater Manchester but across across the UK. And I raised the matter of uh, you know the environment bill and, and air quality in Stockport last week in DEFRA questions. And a lot of what you said ties into that. And uh, there's a lot of things coming in Greater Manchester when it comes to taxis and public transport. But I think obviously I have a I have an interest in Metrolink because we don't have Metrolink in Stockport and. I know you and Elise have been working to get that delivered in, in Stockport, so uh, I'd love to make some progress on that. And, and Jim, of course, is a great champion of our, of our region. So yeah. thanks. No, thanks, Nav. Uh, and absolutely, um, the v vision of Metro, you know, Merrill, Merrill Development Corporation delivering 3,500 modern homes in town centre Stockport with Metro and coming is just a fantastic vision for a town, isn't it? And you know, we've all agonized about how do you how do you regenerate towns outside of the city for, for many years and i think stockport is getting dangerously cl close to cracking it to showing how you can do it uh, and that's what the mdc can do you know it's um, it could really be a, a template for other places in, in the rest of the country where you know you create a vision that goes beyond transport it's about knitting transport with residential and, and then what remains of the retail, you know, making sure that's of the right quality for the people who'll be living in the in the town, putting the green space in as TFGMR at Stockport Interchange, the, you know, the rebuild of Stockport Interchange. Um, it's exciting, but I think Metrolink completes the vision, doesn't it? Um, and, you know, we'll certainly be pitching to the government. Uh, well, in the future of Greater Manchester package, that TFGM will put a five-year delivery plan out and, you know, you will see that um, Metrolink to Stockport is remains one of our very uh, top um, priorities um, but then we'll be bidding for that funding you know going through the, the spending review and if uh, Mary and William would join with you and the three of you would say to the government look it, you've got Lord Kerslake chairing a Stockport Mayoral Devel Development Corporation you've got a plan here that is utterly coherent um, you know what's not to like here if you really want to level up and build 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 then take this and, and do it you know so there's a great lobbying opportunity for you, but obviously we're, we're right. You'll be leading the charge, but we're absolutely right behind you with all the information that you might need. Just on that, I mean, I absolutely, I think, that, I think that was a really good overview, Andy, and I think the vision is brilliant and it totally signed up and I think we'd probably all support it, but the, the, the big problem is going to be that revenue support, isn't it? Because that's what makes London work as well yeah. as it does. Um, and I suppose we just we just need the angles, we just need the arguments as to as to why GM. Um, you know, we can maybe be an exemplar for the country, um, but you know, if if the the government have to put a lot of money into GM, they'll they they may well argue they'll have to put a lot of money into other um, areas, and we we just need to we need those arguments about why why we. Um, why we can help them level up, I suppose, is, is the, the point you're making. But yeah, we are, I think we're, we're probably all very keen to help do that lobbying, but um, any, any sort of support we can get in terms of making those arguments, that would be very helpful. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, you're right, though. It's a, you know, this is um, something that UK government, maybe the civil service side of UK government will want to resist. I think if you go back to the mid 80s and the deregulation experiment that was Sort of foisted on everybody. The idea, the, the, the attraction, let's say, to the UK Treasury was, oh, the market solves everything, therefore we don't have to subsidise anymore. And, or, or minimal subsidy, which is what we've got, isn't it? You know, with the dysfunctional way that that small amount of money works. Um, the bus services operators grant. Um, I mean, clearly that's failed because it's left us, as I said, with four pound bus tickets compared to one pound 50 bus tickets. And Boris knows it's failed because he was mayor of London and he knows why their system works and ours doesn't. Um, so, you know, I think levelling up needs to be expressed in those terms until 
a bus journey in Greater Manchester costs the same as it costs in London, we haven't leveled up, have we? We haven't, you know, we haven't created the parity that leveling up says it will create. Uh, and, and that can't be done. And I've made this very plain to people in number 10. That cannot be done without putting subsidy into the GM, into the GM bus system. Um, it, it, it's not about throwing money into it, but it's about a, a decent level of subsidy that creates a, a London style uh, system. And, you know, the government came in with a clear promise to do that, didn't it? Leveling up, first speech the Prime Minister made in Manchester was, we will improve your buses. That was basically what he came up to, to say. And I think, you know, governments have other priorities, other pressures, but they did that was a central promise of what they said they would, would do. And I think what I'm saying to them is, go with us and you will be able to demonstrate you've done it within a parliament because GM has already done all the hard work over many, many years. Um, but the crunch moment is arriving, I, I, I think, because um, we don't get the backing. If GM goes it alone and tries to reform buses, we will, we will do it very much, you know, we will definitely do it. But it would be a very different system to one that would have a decent level of, um, of public support within it. But, you know, I think that the arguments are there, Jeff, aren't they? You know, you, you, you can't will the ends of a London style system without the means, can you? Great, well, thank you so much for your time, Andy, and thank you for the contribution that you continue to make to the All Party Group uh, to inform MPs and industry leaders as well. It's really appreciated. No, it's been a great opportunity, Jim. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Please look out for this stuff that's coming in a, in a couple of uh, couple of weeks. So uh, it, it's helpfully coming, just obviously pre spending review and uh, pre um, uh, devolution white paper. So you know, for Nav and others, you know, and Jeff, you know, the, there are going to be lobbying opportunities for you when you look at the TFGM five year delivery plan. So you know, it's 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 uh, well timed, hopefully, because what we want to do is come out of the come out of the crisis with clarity about where GM is going. And I think we've got it, uh, uh, Jim, and I think we've got a spatial framework now that is, you know, much more in a place that people might find palatable. So it's still going to be difficult, obviously, but hopefully all of this hangs together. So brilliant, Jim. Thanks a lot. Uh, good to see everybody. See you soon. Great. Cheers, Andy. Um, can I encourage uh, people on the call to open the chat function and you'll see uh, contributions are being made throughout uh, the contributions uh, on the video. We've got some from John, uh, Mark and Andrea uh, that are already in the chat. So do, uh, do use that function uh, to kind of contribute throughout. We're now going to move to the industry panel uh, and get some reflections uh, on the contributions that have already been made, but also an insight uh, depending on the particular perspective uh, of the speaker. So I'm going to ask Karen uh, Smart to come in first. Karen, over to you. I believe you've had disabled screen sharing whoever the host is, which will make sharing the slides a little bit harder, I think. I'm really hoping that's somebody, not me. Uh, sure <laughs> oh, there we go, it's someone who's just undone it seamlessly. Hang on. Yeah, it should be fine, Jeff. There we go. Can everybody see that? Everyone see? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Karen, are you okay with your audio? Should be able to hear. Hang on. It sounds very faint on, on mine. I can't hear you. Give me one second. Right, are we there? Is that better? Okay. We can ask everybody who isn't speaking to mute. That might help okay. you with feedback issues. I'm going to mute myself. Jill, if you could do the same and yeah. others on the call, please. Is that better now? Hello. 
And now how are we doing? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Right, we'll crack on. So, um, sorry about that. So technology troubles here. So it's great having the technology if we know how to work it properly. But yeah, recently joined Manchester from uh, East Midlands Airport as a managing director, but also worked at Stansted before that. So I have got a, a heavy background in aviation. But um, I met Jim recently and it, for me it's great to be back here because I'm actually a Stockport girl. And so to actually come back and run an airport that I used to stand outside and what, look at uh, what was going on as a little girl is, is fantastic. So very much uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I've got my northern roots. But if we move into giving you an overview of where we've been as the airport um, over the last few months, many of you will be fully aware of the impact that uh, COVID 19's had on our passenger operation. Um, and not just here at Manchester, but also at all airports across the UK. So come in March, we essentially came to a, a standstill and, and that was the, the case for the next three months. And at the moment, Manchester's handling around 20,000 passengers a day, almost 80,000 fewer than the same time uh, last year. So it is significant. So. Since the start of this year, January to August, we've handled 5.6 million passengers. Ordinarily, um, we would have uh, handled 20 million at this moment in time. And the reason this matters so much, not only for us as business, but how important the airport is to the region. And people talk about airports uh, having symbiotic relationships with the region and none uh, so important as here in Manchester. Um, in 2019, travel and trade facilitated by Manchester Airport actually translated into £5.3 billion in GBA for our regional economy. And so when we talk about the levelling up, uh, Andy spoke very eloquently about the need for levelling up. I think that's equally as important here in the airport um, sector that, that actually Manchester and aviation needs to have access to the markets here in the north that London has because it's the broader trade and travel that, that actually is contributing to the economy. So although the majority of the air travel we said then ceased in March and um, remained, whilst we remained open at the, the government's request and facilitated the repatriation flights, it was very low traffic. We had less than 5% of the passengers, and I hear stories about when there were literally less than 100 passengers a day coming through the airport, which is, is unthinkable. But in July, the government opened up the travel corridors. Uh, we've been very much at the core of that across the airport with child and children today, um, requesting the corridors to open up, to develop the, and initially um, that made 75% of our, our journeys taken from Manchester uh, in the last year available. And I actually joined the airport to start to do the transition in July. And that was at the time when we had 75% of the markets open. I was one of the very fortunate ones who got to go away on holiday for, for two weeks from July. And uh, when I came back, that had um, declined significantly. In fact, we'd lost 25% of the markets in the two weeks I was away. Where we sit today is we've got around 39% of our markets open and our largest markets for tourism and travel, Spain being one of them, um, is, is obviously it's the main line that is closed. So without that international um, travel and trade, the economy is not going to grow. Um, the Northern Powerhouse will not get off the ground and the levelling up won't take place. So. Um, it's really important for us that we do manage to, to open up the airport to its full potential just as soon as we possibly can. So whilst um, in our industry, safety and security is always at the fore and, and keeping the country safe um, will always be our priority. Um, what we do know is that um, policies have been applied elsewhere in Europe that if we, applied them in the UK, that would, could help us to protect aviation and um, allow the economy to grow as a whole. And what we've got here is an example of what the UK is doing currently compared to um, what Germany are doing. But there are other countries as well as Germany that we could use as examples um, of where, where we currently differ. Um, so Germany is providing rigorous testing. What the rigorous testing is doing is it's reducing the quarantine isolation times, both um, uh, uh, the testing both at the airport and the testing at home. 
They're also using a very much a regionalised approach. We have been incredibly um, uh, grateful of the recent announcements of the islands being classed as regionalised from the mainland. Um, and, uh, but the, there's more that we can do on that. So uh, as an example, Germany um, will do a regionalised approach within a country. Um, making sure that people are free to travel in the country um, but but recognizing the parts of that country that, that are at high risk of covid and then going alongside that is the transparency so germany will publish um, the the numbers of areas within and communities within a country and it's um it's very obvious when they're they that the or they're, they're able to tell their, their public about areas of, of interest. So they're able, to, they're able to make their own informed decisions on where they should travel and where they shouldn't. I think what we've seen in the UK, the consumer confidence has been rocked. And I know many people who've not canceled just one holiday, but two or three holidays because at short notice, we've taken offline some of the, the countries that previously had free travel with them. So there are a number of priorities that we're asking for as a, as a business and as an industry, but given the time that we've got, I, I just want to pick out uh, two or three of those that um, uh, we're working with to keep all of our local MPs informed. And um, uh, we've been very grateful for the support we've had to the date in them um, helping us to get the message across. So the three things that I want to highlight are really the need to implement testing to shorten the quarantine times, as we've seen um, in Germany, but also in other countries. I think there is scientific evidence to show that a test after five days is equally as effective as a quarantine of 14 days. And we certainly need to move more towards that more rapid testing. We need to expand on the regionalization um, uh, policy to allow low risk areas to stay open even within country so that people feel able to travel and we need to put in place um, policies that give aviation a fighting chance um, and there are a number of these that we could point to um, and including APD there's the, the business rate matter that we've got um, different positions on at the moment but I want to make points and say that we need to be clear that outside of the furlough scheme um, we haven't, as an industry, been given a package of support. And just this week, the government has proposed to remove the VAT exemptions for airside products, meaning that airside retail will not be able to compete with that of other countries in Europe. This is a massive disadvantage to the UK uh, as a whole and to Manchester as a region, because people who are um, may choose to bypass the UK and travel through our European countries because actually it's more cost effective for them to do that. So policies like this need to change to protect the sector, to protect the regional, but also the UK economy. And I'm going to leave it at that for now, recognising the time, but happy to take any questions in due course. Great. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm guessing many people, Karen, haven't uh, been to see the new terminal at Manchester Airport yet, but I can say in terms of uh, us being a gateway uh, to the world, it is hugely impressive uh, and the result of a lot of hard work from uh, from you and the team. So uh, thank you for also hosting myself and Mike Kane uh, on, on that visit. That's really appreciated. Um, we're going to take uh, questions at the end, so we're going to wrap, wrap through the contributions uh, just now. And if I can ask Louise Collins from Transport Focus to come in next, please. Louise, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll also attempt to share my screen. So let's hope we have some success here. Um, okay, so that looks to me as though you can see it. I hope you can. Um, transport Focus, for those of you who maybe don't know us so well, we're the Transport User Watchdog. Uh, we've been carrying out research, talking to people since very early on in lockdown, trying to understand their attitudes to public transport, what travel is like for them at the moment, and also the experiences of people who are actually travelling. We've done that both through a, a tracker survey, which is kind of the hard numbers, understanding week on week how many people are saying a certain thing. And we've also got communities of bus and rail users who give us the context and tell us the stories. So I'll draw on both of those today. And just to say as well that, you know, we are short of time. I'm concentrating very much on the here and now, what people are telling us about the barriers to traveling on public transport 
and this is all about the short term but we're hugely interested in the longer term the build back better and the opportunities to use COVID to, to really create a, a public transport system that's fit for the future. So the two areas that I'm going to talk about are about the perception among those not yet traveling and the actual experience for those who are. So what we see is that there is still a significant chunk of people who are avoiding public transport or don't feel it's safe. So there's a lot going on in this chart, but the yellow line, that's 26% of people saying in the last seven days, they've been avoiding public transport. And the blue line, 24% saying they don't feel safe using public transport at the moment. So exploring why that is, the, the reasons are, are really about the, the face coverings is one of the key, key reasons. And that's people worrying that other people won't be wearing them but also the other side of the coin, not wanting to wear it themselves, either just because they don't like it or because they have a health condition, maybe an exemption, but worry about the kind of grief they'll get from other passengers if they're not wearing it. So that's a real concern. There is an unfortunate assumption that public transport is unclean, a sense of having to touch surfaces that others have touched and that that's not particularly pleasant but also that public transport isn't being as well cleaned as other places. And then there's a concern about the perception that it would be crowded, hard to maintain distance. And obviously that only gets worse as more people are traveling and so on. And what we're really seeing is that kind of general lack of trust in others to follow the rules. So the sense that, oh, well, I'll do my bit, but will other passengers? And I think the crucial thing that we're seeing here is these challenges are similar to the ones faced potentially by shops and restaurants and pubs, but actually people think that public transport may not be as safe as those places. And this is the bit that, that kind of worries me a bit. So the people not using public transport in the last seven days, 44% of them think that public transport will be less safe than shops, restaurants or pubs. So I know transport operators are doing you know, loads of really good work in this area, but I think there is still something to be done around getting the message out to, to the lapsed users, so the people who were before but aren't now, to let them know that it will be a safe and pleasant experience. And then moving on from that, just very briefly to look at actually what's it like if you are traveling now? Well, satisfaction with the journey overall, I think is pretty good. So on this chart, we've got train on the top, bus on the bottom, and the, the green dotted line shows a, a rolling three week average. So I think you can take that to indicate the trend. So it is going very slightly downwards recently, but in terms of journey overall, you know, it's pretty good. But I think where there is a bit of a concern, we're seeing a, an emerging trend for declining satisfaction and also maybe a bit more worryingly, increasing numbers of people who are a bit dissatisfied with whether other people are wearing face coverings, the ability to keep a safe distance. So just the things that I've talked about that we know put people off. And I think the concern here is that people who have traveled but don't feel they've had a great experience then go on to tell other people and put those people off. And this is this kind of captures the, the, the spirit of how people are feeling. This is a question about satisfaction with what the operator did to help passengers travel safely and what you can see from this chart is it, it is a bit lower than overall satisfaction so you know um, in the most recent week only 54 percent of people were satisfied with this measure on the train and actually 13 percent were dissatisfied on bus that was 62 percent satisfied and eight percent dissatisfied so you know again loads of excellent work being done by the industry. Some of this is out of the industry's control. It's about trains and buses getting busier. It's about the fact that there are more stories in the news about infection rates increasing. So those things have an impact on perception. But I, I do think that these emerging trends are kind of worth taking note of and that the industry just needs to think about how it can maybe more actively manage some of the onboard environment to make people feel that they're getting a really good journey so they're the two thoughts that i'd leave you with one is about tackling the negative and unfair perception among those who haven't yet traveled and one is about making sure that there's real good active management of the situation so that people who are traveling have a really great journey experience thank you louise that's uh, fantastic 
Uh, Jill, can I just check uh, the presentations that have been shared on the screen? Are those, is it possible to have all the emailed around after the meeting? Yeah, we, we will circulate those um, and, uh, for, and put them on the website. So that's great. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jill. Uh, can I ask uh, Lucia Majewski Kent uh, to come in now, who's the Regional Development Manager from Transpennine uh, Express? Hi there, good morning. Thanks, Jill. Good morning. Um, Hi there. Are you able to come slightly closer to the micro, uh, microphone so we can hear you a bit more? Yes, is that better? Can you hear me better? It's probably slightly faint on my side, but uh, yeah, it's definitely audible, so yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I don't have slides, so I'm afraid you just have to, to listen to me, but um, I think it's fair to say that all transport operators have been stunned by the dramatic effects of the COVID pandemic um, and the speed at which it impacted passenger behaviours and our businesses. Um, seeing travelling numbers dropping by 95% almost overnight at the start was extremely difficult and tough. But as an industry, as we do, we, we pulled together and we responded um, through the government support and the implementation of the emergency measures agreement at TPE. We were able to run a number of services for key workers through the worst of the pandemic. Um, through the work we did with North of England Contingency Group and, and following feedback from our stakeholders, we've been able to incrementally increase that timetable. And, and whilst the numbers are rising steadily, it's still only at 40 percent compared to where we were this time last year. We're seeing a small number of services getting busier, um, predominantly at weekends, you won't be surprised. Um, Saturdays and Sundays are, are pretty busy for us now, but commuters and the business travellers have adapted to new patterns of working as, as we're doing today. And so the numbers returning to the office are still low. Um, that morning and evening commuter peak that we used to see no longer exists. And you won't be surprised to hear that pre-lockdown, the biggest priority for our customer was always train performance and sufficient capacity. Um, we've recently carried out some customer research as well, um, echoing um, what Transport Focus have just said, and, and we found that in this new world, the number one priority for customers is a combination of observing social distancing and cleanliness. So are the trains and the station environment clean, and am I going to be safe and well if I travel by train? Um, it's disappointing to see some of the, the figures that have been presented, because we, we have been working incredibly hard to ensure our stations, trains and the depots where our colleagues work meet the highest cleanliness standards and our train presentation teams have increased cleaning on board massively, um, focusing on the areas that customers and colleagues are likely to touch. We, we're using a powerful long lasting sanitizing treatment which actually does kill 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria on surfaces. Um, our services have never been cleaner um, and we're using all our communication channels to keep our customers updated on the latest advice to reassure them that it is safe to return to rail, as well as ensuring our colleagues are well briefed to be able to offer the support to customers. It's due to these efforts that, to, and the social distancing measures that we have in place that we did actually receive a, a Visit Britain Good To Go accreditation that helps to reassure our customers it is safe to travel with us. Um, I'm sure over time performance and getting a seat will no doubt bubble back up the priority list for customers. But I think we can assume that high expectations of cleanliness will always be a feature from now on as well. Our efforts will need to be visible to the customer and they'll need to continue to be effective. You know, we're dealing with coronavirus now, but it could well be something else this time next year. And I think for that reason, we can assume that social distancing will be a feature in our society for some time to come. So this poses us with a, an enormous conundrum. How do we build back a better public transport customer base and at the same time provide customers with that square meter each in which to travel. We're working with other train operators and with industry partners as well such as Rail Delivery Group and Network Rail to ensure that we're ready to respond and, and one way we can do this is by working together to opti optimise like public transport capacity across the various modes, bus, tram as well as train. Um, to maximise social distance and opportunities for the greater good of stimulating the region as a whole. You know, another priority at TP is to continue the timetable which our customers can rely on. As we know, the more boringly reliable our services are, the better this is for our customers. We now have strong and reliable train performance that, you know, running around 90% of the timetable, but we're also in the mid to high 90s in the public performance measures which is a number that I think we haven't seen for many years. Um, you'll be aware of the constraints associated with the Castlefield Corridor. 
and the challenges that this poses and obviously the majority of our services are rooted through there so you know one of the challenges we have is now we've got this performance level how do we maintain it through the recovery um, our most immediate issue is also is the backlog of driver training that we now have obviously due to training being suspended in March and the agreed way forward having to be COVID safe there's a bit of a backlog um, it's going to take time to re resolve and you know we have a plan in place but obviously one of the issues we've got that there's a possible risk to train performance as we ramp up the, uh, the timetable to make sure we've got enough drivers that are in place as I've already said you know we, we have this reliable timetable we need to protect it um, but the Transpennine route upgrade blockades will start next year and whilst this is of course hugely welcomed investment for the north it's also going to be extremely disruptive to our customers at a time when confidence in public transport is already being tested along with network rail and transport for the north a lot of work is taking place to ensure we've a reliable alternative service in place for when the works progress and that our customers are well informed both of the alternative travel plans they need to make but also of the benefits that TRU will bring to them and their communities in the longer term so bringing our customers with us on the TRU journey should ensure the timing and temporary disruption that takes place does not undermine all the positive endeavours that have taken place. As I'm talking to you now, the next contract for operating the TP franchise is currently being finalised. So whilst I don't know what this will look like, I know that we're going to receive more details over the weekend and early next week. I hope that it will continue to provide us and other operators in the north with the contractual flexibility to continue to be good and efficient train operators. Um, with very welcome funding support from the government, coupled with the autonomy to make key decisions for the North in the North. I'd like to just finish by saying that as much as we can try and plan for and stimulate a recovery, and I hate to use this term again, but in these unprecedented times, how do you prepare for something that's hugely unknown? I mean, we're all learning with this. We're all, all of us here, you know, working together, working closely with our stakeholders to look at ways in which we can encourage more people back to using public transport in a safe and sustainable way. The best way Transpennine Express can do this is by delivering a reliable, safe service that assures people it's safe to use us to visit the incredible towns and cities that we've got in the north and then Greater Manchester or even to get back into the workplace. So you know, we'll, we'll keep working to deliver our promises and to provide our part of the transport system to stimulate the economic growth that the region needs to enable us to grow even more. Uh, Thank you, and uh, like uh, everybody else, I'll take questions if uh, if anybody has anything that they uh, they want to ask. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we're next going to take uh, Daniel uh, Coughlin. Uh, Daniel, over to you. Thanks very much, Jim, um, and uh, thank you to Jill and her colleagues uh, for the opportunity today. Um, I suppose when you, whether you call it a, a northern powerhouse, levelling up, or, or, or simply a, a fairer society, um, the important ambition of creating an economically balanced country is, is a long-term vision. Whether it's tackling the historic north-south divide in educational attainment, increasing productivity by creating skilled jobs in new sustainable industries, or improving our rail network to allow business and leisure travellers to get around the north, the north more efficiently. These are not challenges that will be addressed in the short term, uh, for example, in one five-year government tenure. And I think this is why amid noises about whether we need investment in high-speed uh, rail, it's the firm view of us and the business leaders that we represent that high-speed uh, networks in the north are critical to the future of, of the northern powerhouse and indeed to the whole country. Ensuring that HS2 is delivered in full on both sides of the Pennines and integrated fully and strategically with, with northern powerhouse rail must remain at the top of the government uh, of the north asked to government high speed north will report back at end of this year at which point finally we might get some clarity about when work might start how businesses can get involved and how the concept of the virtual city across the pennines could could be delivered and i suppose now is not the time to wobble on the importance of high speed rail um, obviously we're seeing rising infection rates and testing woes and it's an extremely worrying time but it is expected and, and very much hoped by all of us that covid will be a relatively short-term blip rather than a long-term trend. The, the, the importance of people and goods being able to move effectively and efficiently around the north uh, and around the whole country uh, should not be underestimated and, and the investment potential and local economic growth that HS2, NPR and, and Transpennine upgrades will bring could transform the northern economy. 
I think it's very important that stations must be at the heart of this growth. Manchester Piccadilly opening up the south of the city centre and creating an innovation district around the university. Uh, Leeds, where spades are in the ground already and the South Bank is starting to be transformed. But, but not just the big cities, towns on the edges of Greater Manchester and outside um, should be looking to position their stations as central to growth plans and getting ready for HS2 and NPR compatible services. The economic benefits of providing high-speed rail to the north are numerous and I'm sure are well known to, to, to the people on this call, but equally important is the role it can play in meeting our, our 2050 net zero target. Taking hundreds of thousands of HGVs and cars off the road will, will cut emissions significantly uh, and allow people and goods to move around the country more, more effectively. 32% of transport emissions are related to HGV and vans, while rate freight, uh, rail freight emissions uh, are on average 76% lower than the equivalent road freight journey. If we are to build back better, high-speed rail must be a part of that. And we've heard uh, from Karen about the, 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 the real challenges Manchester Airport are facing at the moment, but equally as, a, as the long-haul hub for the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands, you know, Manchester Airport needs sustainable development of aviation, providing the benefits of international connectivity to support economic growth and levelling up. Currently, four out of five passengers uh, and staff use road to access the airport. So improvements to rail are hugely needed to enable that modal shift. And the current crisis with people unable to travel and, and trade is, is hugely damaging for the northern economy. In terms of local transport, and, and very much echoing a lot of what Andy said here, Integrating those local networks has to be the way forward. You know, Andy's plan for how bus, tram, train, Metrolink services would all integrate is a vision of how a, high, uh, how a city region's transport network should operate. But the issue remains that without that London style ticketing that he referred to and that seamless switching between modes of transport, somebody commuting, say, from Bolton to South Manchester could face paying separately for bus, train and tram you know, maybe around £15 every day, and allowing mayors the right to fully integrate those local services would be a huge step forward. As with so many of the fundamental principles of the Northern Powerhouse, devolution underpins everything, uh, and transport is no different. So COVID has somewhat stalled the government's levelling up agenda, but it has to be a key aspect of the recovery. There has to be that long-term commitment to the North, not simply short-term sticking plasters. Yes, the world of work will change. We'll be doing more of these calls and events and, and people will have more flexible work patterns choosing to travel when it suits them. But the fundamental principles of the Northern Powerhouse, levelling up or whatever you want to call it, remain. It's our firm view that the best way to propose, manage and deliver Northern transport improvements is locally with powerful, powerful elected accountable leaders. A fully devolved North with real powers and responsibility capable of shaping the future of our city regions and towns for generations to come. Great, thank you for that, Daniel. Uh, next, we're going to take Mary Cray, uh, who uh, all the parliamentarians will know uh, on this call, uh, a very good friend uh, to Parliament, uh, and a Chief Executive Officer now at Living Street. So, Mary, over to you. Hi, Mary, you're on, you're, you're silent on my end. It's slightly reassuring to be honest, it's not just me that has gremlins in my, <laughs> in my system. No. Mary, do you want us to give you five minutes maybe to restart and we'll, we can kind of go into questions and bring you in at the end and flip it around like that? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, so we've, we've heard a number uh, of contributions that have really set out. Uh, one, the scale of the challenge, uh, particularly with COVID, but I think also the scale of the opportunity. Uh, and we've done really well for attendance on this call, actually, when I'm looking at the, the screen and uh, the representation that we've got. So it'd be great to uh, get straight into uh, questions. And uh, we've had a piece of missing one that I'm just going to find on the sheet, John, unless you can call it out now. 
Yeah. <laughs> worked it out god i've got no there's no one in the office there's no one to help me it's it's terrible yeah sure if I, I've, I've got very quick presentation i just wanted to skip through uh with people to just do an intro um to what we do and in particular what we do uh in greater manchester so um if I try and share my screen, this might be way above my um, pay grade, but um, let's see if we can manage that. Uh, oh no, we'll do it on PowerPoint. Let's do it on PowerPoint. That might not be possible either. Um, let me see if I can do slideshow. Right, so I just wanted to talk very quickly about what we do at Living Streets. For those of us, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are formerly the pedestrian association but with the national charity for everyday walking and obviously with lockdown many of us have been reconnecting with walking and um, our mission is to get everybody to have a, a better walking environment and to inspire people to walk more. Um, Covid I think has uh, revealed and exacerbated existing inequalities and um, we've got a little picture here of this poor lonely man um, who put a little sign in his window in lockdown because he lost his wife, he has no friends and family and was sort of desperate for uh, somebody to, to talk to. Um, and of course there can be no sort of social mobility which is something that obviously Andy and the elected colleagues on the call are very passionate about without physical mobility and so if you, if you force people into their homes you're going to cut off their life chances and I for me thinking about what's happening and the unemployment I think there's a real threat to social mobility especially for those 16 to 24 year olds who would now be starting their apprenticeships starting their first days in the office and who are seeing a whole series of barriers from the virus uh, to getting on in life um, but of course loneliness uh, also threatens physical health so we've had the government's uh, two billion pounds announcement on uh, active travel to 250 million of that has already been spent um, and for us that has three key sort of um, areas where we think there's a, a real opportunity to make some uh, dynamic social change. Uh, tackling inequalities, we're beginning to see really interesting um, figures around um, you know, BAME, people from BAME communities being more likely to be victims on the road. We want to see better integrated, active and sustainable journeys. Walking is the oldest, cheapest, greenest transport there is. And we want to make sure that things are done with the community. I think some of the battles in Manchester, um, potentially around the, the Levenshume project, people feel that things are being done to them rather than with them. But also the voice of the vocal minority can sometimes drown out um, the silent majority that might be in favour of uh, cleaner, greener walking. Um, so we've got a series of challenges coming up. We know the government wants to spend £10 million on electric vehicle charging points. Why are they always put on pavements? Um, why aren't they put in the road? I know the traffic engineers' answers to that, but I'm, you know, from a pedestrian point of view, that is not uh, clear. We're seeing... Um, you know pavement clutter pavement parking the government consulting on a ban on pavement parking but the good um news is that we have seen uh, pop-up cycle lanes pop-up highways um and pop-up pavements and of course that is driving uh, walkers people back into the high streets to spend money uh in the cafes and shops um we know that in greater manchester we um work with the mayor on um delivering um walk to school programs so part of this is about the behavior change educating people about the fact that something might have closed and that, that it might now be safe um, to do to, to do that walk and we know that 60% of car journeys are um, journeys of under two miles that are eminently walkable um, so we have 136 schools um, in Manchester across all 10 local authorities and if colleagues on the call are interested in um, 
the list of schools I can certainly send them out to you I've written to you all um, last week about that it's on the 5th of October and uh, we do have the ability to give some packs out for free if you think there are some schools that would benefit um, from that where schools which have a particular uh, congestion problem or where you think there are particular equalities issues so do please get in touch with me afterwards if that's something you'd like to do we would like to see um, in those schools we know that the journeys active journeys are up 16 percent we have an award-winning travel tracker program so we can measure the amount of cars that we're taking uh, off the uh, roads and we do also want to expand in greater manchester with the number of schools that do our all year round challenge which is called wow which gives little children a monthly badge which i'm just holding up here to my camera um, and gets them out doing street audits um, and encouraging their parents to do park and stride so we are all also passionate um, about people we're passionate about working with bus companies and train companies because we know that uh, a bus journey has an average of 17 minutes walking attached to it a car journey has an average of one minute uh, attached to it so we know people want to change we know the importance of pedestrians to our uh, economy we know that we're all now walking from home and we want people uh, to do a lot more of that and we think there's a really exciting uh, moment here with active travel to build on some of the changes um, so that we do build back better. We create uh, neighbourhoods that are designed around people, uh, where people feel safe to walk, cycle and safely scoot. And um, I just encourage um, those of you on the, on the uh, call to get in touch, particularly around the um, Walk to School Week, which is coming up very, very soon. So um, we, we have a lot of experience in this. And, People tend to focus on um, the hard infrastructure type of things, but actually um, it is also very much the, um, the culture change that we really need to drive. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Mary. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you to all those contributions, actually quite wide ranging in the end, which was really, uh, really good as an insight. Uh, we're gonna take contributions now from uh, the MPs and peers on the call who are members of the All Party Parliamentary Group and then of course we'll open it up then to others uh, to make contributions uh, to. So uh, since we started, uh, Kate Green uh, has joined the call and, and also Lord Stunnel. Um, we've still got Jeff uh, Smith on the call so can I ask, um, if, if I go through in the order you're on my screen just to check if you have a question that's probably slightly easier way of doing the MPs and peers and then I'm going to come on to the chat in terms of people that have indicated uh, beyond that. So, Jeff, have you got any uh, questions or observations on the presentations that you've seen? Um, well, thanks everybody for the, for the presentations, very interesting. Ma really nice to see you, Mary. Hope, the, uh, hope you're enjoying the new role. Um, I, I had a question which I'm not sure any, whether anybody can answer, because it sort of cuts across a few, a few areas, because um, what I've seen, you know, this is anecdotal, but what I've seen recently is um, the bus is getting much, much busier. Um, and actually slightly more uncomfortable. I, I, I don't have a car anymore. I gave my car up. So I use the bus in Manchester and, and in London. And um, it's getting much more difficult to socially distance on buses. Um, and I think, um, going back to what Louise was saying about um, the reluctance to use public transport, I think people will get more reluctant to use public transport as they, as they get more crowded. Um, but what I've also seen, I think, is, is um, all of a sudden, the last week or two, the, the road's getting much busier with, with private cars. Now, I, I can only assume that people are getting back into cars um, because they're reluctant to get on public transport. And, um, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's a worry, I suppose. And I, I, I wonder if anybody has any up-to-date figures about the um, about car usage. Because I remember seeing some figures during the, the height of the, the lockdown where uh, private car use or use on the roads um, had, had plummeted and that was very obvious. I live on a main road so I could see there was hardly any traffic around. Today uh, it's kind of nose to tail at, um, at rush hour. So I just wondered whether anybody could advise on that. And other than that, I'm, I'm very keen to hear some of the uh, other people on the call. I know Ali's got a couple of interesting questions which I'd be interested to hear the answers to. Thanks. Great, thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, Andrew, can I ask if you've got any questions? Yeah, um, if I can just say that 
the, the presentations have been excellent and, and very wide ranging. Uh, it's, it's hard to be positive about where we will be with public transport in 12 months time, um, because I think that reluctance is going to persist through the winter uh, and it's clearly going to put a huge economic burden on transport operators or by extension to the government and it's it's difficult to see how that will happen um, i'd like to be positive about it but i'd be interested to know whether any of the panelists have got a not so much a golden bullet but a thing that they think would uh, significantly help to move things forward apart from having a vaccine of course um, the other thing is just in relation to uh, building back better and the the walking agenda the cycling agenda I, I think it's great that we've got some money coming into the system and there's a lot of, um, what shall I say, activist pressure for these things to happen. But the silent majority that was referred to by one of the uh, speakers isn't necessarily in favour of these changes. And um, there's a good deal of local community resistance to uh, things which make it even more difficult to travel on the road or perceived to be. Um, so again, I think, uh, I'd like to be really positive about this. It should be a real opportunity to, for change in a positive direction. But uh, once again, I'd be interested to know, uh, particularly perhaps from our pedestrian uh, representative, whether they see some golden key that can be turned to get much more positive community engagement and support for uh, the, the pedestrian and cycling changes for which there's now money at long last. Thank you, Andrew. And Kate? Thanks, Jim. Apologies that I missed some of the presentation. So it may be that um, you have addressed one of my questions. I just wanted, first of all, though, to follow Andrew's comment and ask how the community can be actively involved in helping to design some of these transport solutions. When Chris Boardman first appeared in Greater Manchester, it was something he came and talked to us about in Trafford. And I thought it was actually very exciting. And some of those changes didn't need to be massively uh, didn't need to be massive infrastructure changes even. They could be quite small, very local um, changes. But I haven't seen any evidence really of that beginning to happen, of um, communities coming along and saying, if we did this in this way, um, we could actually improve both the environmental and the, and the travel um, experience. And I just wonder if that's actually something that is being embedded into Greater Manchester's um, overall um, spatial transport and climate strategies and community strategies. Um, and then apologies if this was already said, I missed uh, a large part of the presentation on, on rail. But before lockdown, everybody knows how bad the Northern Rail Service was and how extensive the complaints were from commuters, including in my constituency. Can we be reassured that the time during which there's been significantly less passenger traffic on the railways has been well used to rectify some of the deep-rooted structural problems that were causing such a bad service in um, in a lot of our constituencies. We were told um, when Northern Rail lost their franchise and it came back into public control that it would be a two-year program before we began to see any improvements. Well, the first nine months of those two years, there's been virtually no rail travelling public. So has that time been used to make some of these improvements and not to inconvenience the public given they weren't getting on the trains anyway? Uh, thank you, Kate. And I want to take the uh, the questions of those who have either pre-submitted for the meeting uh, or those in the, the, the chat function. And then I'm going to ask the panel members to come back with their reflections. Um, now, we have around 10 minutes left uh, of the session. Uh, so I'm going to ask people to be brief in their question to give time for kind of summary answers at the end. Uh, and I'm going to forego my closing bit uh, just to enable us to get through uh, more questions. Um, in terms of people who have indicated, firstly, I've got Johnny uh, Morgan from Electricity Northwest who's pre submitted. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm Johnny, I'm the External Comms Manager at Electricity Northwest. Um, so we're the local electricity network that operates the, uh, the network uh, in Greater Manchester. Um, and for us, electric vehicles are going to be really key uh, because that's going to have a huge impact on our network. So it's something we're very involved in. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about public transport and, and walking and cycling quite rightly, uh, but electric vehicles are uh, going to be significant in, in Greater Manchester. So some research that we did alongside Caden, the gas network, uh, recently looked at decarbonisation pathways for Greater Manchester for energy for 2038, 
uh, and it showed that we'll need 100,000 public EV charging points uh, across GM by that time, and 96% of cars on the road will need to be electric. Um, so we're reinforcing the network to make sure the network can cope with that, um, but interested in your views as to how we can incentivize people to change to EVs and, and how we can incentivize businesses or encourage businesses um, to understand the role that they have in promoting EVs and making sure that there are adequate charging facilities at, at places of work as well, um, so that the sort of current situation doesn't completely stall all the progress. Great, thank you, John. It'd be really helpful for me with my transport brief to get a copy of that decarbonisation pathway uh, report and be able to share it. Absolutely, yeah. I think we're, we're presenting it at the Green Summit next week as well. So, um, but yeah, definitely, I'll, I'll get a copy of it to you. Great, thank you. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Andrea Lee, uh, who's made some contributions in the chat. Andrea, do you want to come in uh, at this point? Hi, sorry, this is hiding behind my bad hair day. Um, <laughs> uh, it's been really great to hear uh, people acknowledge the uh, importance of tackling air pollution as long, alongside the sort of decarbonisation strategy. Um, sorry, I should probably mention that I am the Clean Air Campaign Manager at Client Earth hence why I'm a bit obsessed with air quality. Um, and I suppose I understand that obviously um, nobody really likes uh, the approach that the government has taken uh, with regards to meeting its legal um, duties to uh, meet legal limits of air pollution that should have been met 10 years ago. Um, but we are where we are. And given that um, there is an urgent need to protect people's health and that actually there are vulnerable groups that suffer more from the harm caused, such as young people, older people, and also um, we have evidence that people from, on, on low incomes and from ethnic minorities tend to be disproportionately affected by this. Um, uh, there was a time back in 2016 when the Greater Manchester, well, Greater, um, Greater Manchester and Manchester hadn't been mandated by government to take action, but Transport for Greater Manchester developed its uh, air quality strategy and in it, it discussed looking at things like clean air zones um, which unfortunately have had many delays uh, through the process. Um, I'm just uh, curious to see how, how people feel about um, uh, the role of uh, vehicle restrictions in helping to get the sort of modal change that we need um, in addition to health and support or can we do it with uh, simply sort of promoting public transport, walking and cycling? Um, and is Greater Manchester acting fast enough? Great, thank you, Andrea. Uh, and next, uh, Ali Abbas uh, has made some contributions in the chat function. Uh, Ali, do you want to come in at this point? Good luck, Jim. Um, so I had a couple of questions just on the um, aviation presentation. So. Um, one was around, there's a GVA figure quoted. I just wanted to check whether that included the tourism deficit, which arises from UK residents traveling overseas and spending money there rather than the regional economy here in the UK. And also um, a question on um, the, the GM city regions uh, obviously signed up to this science-based carbon budget, which is uh, very ambitious and, and uh, really good to see. But that depends on zero growth in UK aviation emissions uh, based on 2018 levels, obviously. Um, will MAG commit to that emissions cap at all three of its airports to help GM meet, meet its budget and stay within its budget? And will it also then, as a result of that, withdraw its appeal against the decision to reject expansion at Stansted? on the grounds of climate change, air pollution and noise. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ali. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, on, on the transport side, we've been covering this hugely in terms of the impact of COVID and uh, financial sustainability, the jobs impact, the supply chain impact, uh, but also the medium and long term planning that has been taking place within industries that might not be fit for purpose going forward. So uh, I, I suspect for most people on the call, even though they're kind of contingency planning and seeing what the new world might look like, there are so many unknowns, uh, it's actually very difficult to do that. But what we can definitely do is to use the opportunities that have been created with the way that people change their everyday habits uh, to, I think, to recess our impact on the environment more generally, uh, you know, right through everything that we do, including transport, but in other areas uh, as well. Okay, now with the time we've got, I'm going to ask, uh, give a minute <laughs> um, for each of the contributors uh, on the panel to uh, pick the question that's most relevant to their background and I'm going to take you in the order that you appear on my uh, on my list. So Karen, if I can take you first. 
but yeah and obviously Ali's two questions I think are the ones obviously most pertinent so the tourism figures that we quoted Ali are all encompassing but I think what's really important is whilst recognizing that without people traveling abroad there will be um, uh, movement and uh, potentially a domestic increase in the UK uh, economy what we've got to recognize is the, the 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 vast amounts of money that overseas visitors spend to the uk so i know the, the whole china debate and and around greater manchester will introduce the flights so what we saw is that the targets for spend uh, uh, from chinese visitors we smashed them in two years opposed to the 10 years that was uh, uh, anticipated and that actually the average spend per tourist went up 94 percent when the chinese visitors when we had the flights laid on um, in the northwest so i think that's quite significant and where it is so it's all in balance in terms of the the, the targets um, mag has committed um, well, as you, I think you're aware and you know, uh, the individual Neil Robinson, who, who chaired the um, aviation, uh, sustainable aviation group. So very much leading from an industry perspective in terms of where we need to go for the 2050 targets, pardon me. But MAG has committed to meet the GM targets 2038 net zero, um, no later than, than 2038. But I think what's really important is, um, and I know that you've done some work on this, we need to get comfortable um, that we've got to get the climate change agenda um, going, um, but, but also we've got to coexist in terms of uh, aviation. Uh, and actually, we need technology, we need government investment, and we need to work together at it. And of course, Karen, you're defending to say this, but that's easy to do from a point of strength and weakness. Uh, if we have a vibrant sector that can invest in new technologies and invest in forward orders, then it's far better than having one that's on its knees. And if you just look at the order books uh, that have even been uh, cancelled or even uh, paused, that has a significant impact when uh, you know travelling behaviour gets back to some sense of normality uh, if those new aircraft haven't been brought forward. So it's, a, it's complex, and I know that there's a real commitment to uh, address the climate issue on that. Um, Louise, can I choose to come in next? Thank you. Um, I think very briefly to touch on the first three questions that were asked. Yes, buses are getting busier and more people are getting in cars. We know that some people have long term plans to switch public transport journeys to car journeys. And that is bad both for road users, for current public transport users and for anyone who currently enjoys walking and, and breathing clean air. Um, there's no silver bullet to fix it it is a carefully curated combination of action by you know the government local authorities and operators to ensure that people are getting a an absolutely perfect journey when they do travel and that the messaging around all that is, is spot on as well and i think kate's point about involving communities and changes is absolutely right and um, it would be a real desperate shame if we didn't seize the opportunity to develop transport systems for the future that really fit what people need. And that is the, the kind of balance now of the short term, let's not lose passengers to other modes right now, and the longer term, how do we make sure systems are really fit for the way we, we live and travel? Great, thank you. And next, uh, Lucia. Uh, yeah, um, I think just reflecting on, on what Kate was saying with regards to, um, you know, Northern had mentioned about the two year program to rectify some of the issues that were in place. You know, obviously, there's new fleets that have been introduced, new trains, which then the drivers need to be trained on. Um, unfortunately, we, I think I mentioned it in my speech that due, due to COVID, we've had to suspend driver training um, because of the in, being in cabs. Um, now, there are plans in place to be able to, re, to resume that, but you know, I, I would be, uh, I, I, it's a risk for us. I think um, we were all working really very hard to ensure that when things do get back to normal, that we're, uh, we're able to provide that service that we are doing now. As I said, performance is at a great level. We're running around 80 to 90% of our full time table and still achieving those high performance number, numbers. So, um, yeah, that, that is, a, is something for us to keep working on and to make sure that we, we can deliver on that. Great, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Daniel. Thanks, Jim. If, if I could pick up on, on Kate's question. Um, this was something that we raised with um, Network Rail very early in the lockdown process. Uh, you know, if no one's using the trains, why can't we get on and deliver some of the upgrades that, that, that are so badly needed? I mean, one of the examples was between Electrify, between Leeds and Huddersfield, for, for, for example. Um, 
there, there was a, a reluctance for a number of probably very good reasons, which I, I haven't got time to go into now, to do that. We, did, we saw it both as a way of getting the upgrades that were needed tackled, but also, of course, of you know, getting the economy moving to a certain extent, like getting people working and, and, and doing projects. Obviously, some of those have been now uh, taken up with um, shovel-ready projects and project speed and, and all these kind of projects, but we would like to have seen more done to have taken forward those improvements that are so badly needed. Just very quickly, I'll take, if I can, Jim, just take one of the questions that surfaced on the chat from Justin Davey very quickly around whether the GM strategy should be reviewed in the light of possibly permanent changes we're seeing to the rail uh, network and does the focus to more quality, affordability and greenness of transport need to be made rather than capacity? Yes and no, uh, Justin, is what I would say to that. Of course, we need to look at quality, affordability, uh, affordability and sustainability. But we have to remember on certainly on the broader northern rail network that capacity is absolutely the biggest constraint to productivity and to businesses and, and people being able to move around more effectively. So uh, we're, if and when things get back to normal, we shouldn't forget that capacity is the biggest reason for doing all of this highly expensive work that we're looking to do with high speed rail. Thank you, Daniel. It's also a generational responsibility. I think, you know, far too often with transport, we just don't make the difficult long term decisions because they don't have the immediate political benefit. Uh, and actually, I think that's a failure when we don't step up to the plate on that. Um, and finally, can I take uh, Mary, please? Thanks very much indeed, uh, Jeff. So um, I just wanted to come back on, on some of the messaging. Um, the evidence in London in the suburbs is that traffic in the suburbs is back up to pre-COVID levels, but in the city centre, it's way, way down. Um, I don't know how that translates across, but people are doing more local journeys rather than heading into the city centre. And um, there is this issue about getting your car versus uh, get on your bike or start walking. And I'm concerned also about the massive switch to e-commerce, which means that we're having a big rise in freight and um, courier deliveries. And there's no point getting people out of their cars if we're then seeing um, a huge increase in uh, delivery vehicles. So that shows the need for cargo bikes, e-bikes, etc. The bus strategy, Andrew, is about to be published and I do think there is a moment here for the mayors and the combined authorities to work with the government in terms of effectively how, what is the new settlement around buses. I'm not sure that that is fixed yet, so I do think this is a, a real moment for uh, parliamentary colleagues to be talking uh, to Andrew Gilligan in number 10 and to um, the transport ministers about what the, what what should the you know the buses look like uh, in terms of co-designing with communities Kate um, we have schools who go out and do audits and you know want very simple things like footpaths upgraded etc and, and listening to children and making sure that the voices of those vulnerable road users is heard is, is at the heart of what we do we know that investment in in pavements has a and in our in our sort of behavior change projects has a cost benefit ratio of nine to one so for every pound you put in you get nine pounds back in the air pollution, the congestion and the health uh, benefits. So that's a huge, huge um, benefit that they're some of the most cost effective projects that you can have and they don't take 30 years and they don't uh, require um, planning, you know, huge amounts of planning permission in the way that things like uh, high speed to etc do. What we see generally is that where you put in low traffic neighbourhoods, you do road space reallocation, it takes about eight weeks for the traffic which eventually evaporates off the streets when you shut the rat runs down um you know there is that sort of difficult bit at the beginning where people will be very vociferous in their opposition but after after two or three months if you go back to communities they are generally happy with that and it, it's um about sort of political courage in a way in terms of of sticking with it but also as i said making sure that people don't feel that we're taking their means of earning a living away from them as andy said at the beginning with the uh, with the taxi drivers who have effectively seen their incomes collapse we do need to make sure that they're involved at an early stage as well Great. Thank you, Mary. Can I thank all of our panellists for uh, their contributions, for asking, answering the questions that were put? Can I thank uh, everybody who's taken the time to be on the call and those who have stayed on uh, despite the slight uh, overrun? I think from the conversation that's taken place, there are definitely some themes that have come out from this. Uh, and I'd ask Jill if you and your team could pull that together into actions that parliamentarians certainly can be taking on to make sure that we land this uh, with government and get support for it. Yeah, I thought we could do some parliamentary questions for, um, you know, to get tabled. 
um, for GEM and APPG um, MPs. So yeah, let's do that. Great, and, and I would encourage people to uh, take a visit to the Devo Connect website, uh, where obviously you'll find articles from Jill uh, and other contributors. <laughs> you'll also find a map of devolution across England. Uh, that's quite useful in terms of where devolution is, but actually it shows you uh, just how uh, much of a challenge we've got for those who believe in devolution and localism, when you consider how many parts of England have no uh, devolved settlement whatsoever. So it's a collective endeavour to make sure that we continue uh, on that journey. Uh, well, thank you all for your time. Thank you for your contributions. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Jim. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Jill.